Uh, Friends, would you please pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks and we give you praise for all the ways that you provide for us, all the ways that you take care of us. We thank you especially that you give us the opportunity to come together, to stand firm together, uh, knowing that you in our baptisms have equipped us with the armor of God, that you make us new in you. Lord Jesus, as we uh, face the, uh, the, the reality of our sin, help us to remind us who you have made us to be as the people of God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, you are caught in the crossfire, and you are a target in the crosshairs. Flaming arrows whiz all around you. You are stuck behind enemy lines, and you are on the front lines. War and death and evil surround you. This is what you wake up to every day. Every day, you wake up to Armageddon. I know what you're thinking. You're like, I don't know, Pastor. My my bed was pretty comfortable this morning. Kind of wanted to stay in it for most of the day. I didn't really want to come to church, but I'm here. So I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor. I get that. But it's true that we do live in spiritual warfare. There is a war going on all around us. War has been waged from heaven against hell, and the prize is God's creation. I know that most of us, when we think of spiritual warfare, we think of ourselves as kind of the victims. We're we're just caught in the middle of all the crossfire. And yet, when we come before God and we confess ourselves as sinners, we're confessing that we're nothing less than public enemy number one. We take God's design for who he makes us to be as men and women in his creation, and we mutilate it. We abuse it. We use it for selfish gain. What God designed to be beneficial for all, we use to abuse and satisfy our own dark cravings. I mean, you heard what Jesus said. He said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. We are public enemy number one. Affairs, pornography, addictions, lies, lust, hatred, murder, abuse, rebellion, divorce, abandonment, cohabitation, one night stands. Anything outside of what God has given us in his good law is an act of war against heaven and earth. You know, it's those sexual sins in particular that are full of potential for isolation and shame and despair and hopelessness. Satan loves your sexual sins. He loves using those against you. Because Satan loves nothing more than to see God's creatures cut off from their creator. Divide and conquer. This is war, right? And that's what Satan loves to see. You cut off from your creator. Satan wants to isolate you, incriminate you, turn you. He accuses you of aiding and abetting the enemy as a traitor to the Almighty. And 
Satan has all the evidence on his side. He tallies your sins. He takes excruciating detail, and then he whispers your trespasses into your soul like burning toxin. So what are sinners to do to deal with their sins? How does our world deal with brokenness? Well, most of the time we create phony religions. We create phony religions as phony remedies for very real sins. Religions that deny sin's existence. Religions that celebrate sins as freedoms. Religions that make sin your slave master. You know what the world says. Deny that your sin even exists. In the face of all the evidence to the contrary, uh, just simply declare yourself not guilty. Or, the world says, celebrate your sin as something wholesome and justified and liberating. Either that, or the world says, well, then you better get to work. If you can't deny your sin or you can't celebrate it, then you've got a lot of work to do. You better start earning God's favor. Earn God's trust earn God's love. Do whatever you need to do to make yourself acceptable to God. Punish yourself, serve your penance, do your time. Be a better mom, be a better dad, be a better spouse, be a better worker, read the Bible more, give more money, be more humble, be a nicer person. Friends, that's all phony religion. It all says, make yourself more acceptable to God because God does not accept sinners. Either that or the religion says, invents a new God with lower standards. Phony religion with phony remedies for real sin. You know, there are churches that fall for phony religion. Churches that proclaim that they are welcoming because they don't call sin, sin. Churches that don't preach sin, friends, they don't preach Jesus. If they're not willing to talk about sin, well, then they're not talking about who Jesus is. Because if a church only preaches affirmation, it means that they won't call you a sinner. And friends, if you don't believe in sin, then you don't believe in a God who forgives. Legalistic churches have the same problem. It's different sides of the, of the spectrum, but it's the same problem. Because churches that are hyper-legalistic tell you something similar. It, they, they tell people that they could easily lose their salvation if they don't perfectly obey the law. And guess what, friends? That's not forgiveness either. Churches that tell you you can lose your salvation if you don't live perfectly, or churches that say, well, maybe you're not sinful anyways, and we'll just celebrate you. Nobody's preaching forgiveness. Friends, that's phony religion. It's not the religion of Jesus. Because Jesus does not need you to be categorized as sinless in order to, to welcome you. Because Jesus loves sinners. I'll say that again because I don't think you believed me the first time. Jesus loves sinners. He doesn't expect them to clean themselves up in order to meet him. 
Jesus loves sinners. Sinners can be honest about their sins because Christ makes sinners new. We are created new in Christ. He alone created the heavens and the earth with none of your help. And he alone will create the new heavens and the new earth, guess what, with none of your help. Help! How many of you uh, uh, gave uh, maybe some, some permission or uh, signed some forms before you were born consenting to your birth? That's what I thought. He alone made you, and you know the refrain, with none of your help. And guess what? He creates you new in Christ, you know how it goes, with None of your help. Jesus does not leave it to you to fix your sin problem. He does it for you, you know the refrain, with none of your help. He takes all the responsibility. He is your head. He is the Christ. Notice what he does. He takes responsibility for your sin. He doesn't deny your sin's existence. He treats it as very real, and then he makes it his own. He doesn't celebrate your sin as some sort of twisted freedom. And he doesn't lower God's standards either. Jesus calls your sin what it is, and then he takes it upon himself, and he nails it to the cross. Jesus loves sinners. You do nothing. Jesus does everything. Jesus makes sinners saints. He makes the old new. In this war between heaven and hell with you in it, Jesus isolates the sin from the sinner. He divides and conquers, and he forgives and absolves. Which means, dear Christian... That in this war of heaven and hell, this spiritual warfare raging all around us, it means that you are still on the battlefield. Just because you are created new in Christ does not yet mean that you are out of the war altogether. The war is still very real, except you are created new in Christ. You might be on the battlefield but you are untouchable. You have a force field of forgiveness. Jesus has equipped you in his own battle armor. You are impervious to death's sting. You are impenetrable to sin's guilt, and you are invulnerable to Satan's flaming arrows. Satan might have all the dirt on you. He might know all the skeletons in your closet. He might have all the evidence to condemn you. He might know everything about you and all your dirty little secrets, enough to put you into hell forever. Except, with all the evidence to the contrary, Christ has fitted you with the armor of of God. You are pardoned by the king who has already won the war. You are a citizen of his new creation. Already. You've been declared so in baptism. The war of heaven and hell, whose prize was all of God's creation, has already been decided. 
This world that we live in is the domain of heaven, and it will live on forever. And you have been given an eternal place in it by Jesus. Which means that as Christians, we no longer ask what we must do to be saved. We don't have to. You know, sometimes I hear other Christians say that, I hope I will be in heaven someday. If you say that, cut it out. (laughs) Because you don't hope that you'll be in heaven someday. You know it. How do you know it? Who told you? Jesus. If Jesus says it, it is true. You know you will be there one day. Which is why as Christians, we no longer ask what we must do to be saved. It's already been decided. That has been answered by what Jesus has already done. So instead, we don't ask what we must do to be saved. Instead, we ask, what kind of people do we want to be in light of who we are in Christ? That's the question I want you to have on your heart. What kind of people are we called to be in light of who we are in Christ? That's a question of freedom. When you have to ask what you have to be do to do to be saved, that's a burden. That weighs on your soul. It forces you to do things that you aren't capable of doing, but when you have been freed by Christ and forgiven by Jesus, then you get to ask a liberating question. Who am I called to be in light of who I am in Christ? Because the answer is, we are the people of God. We belong to him. We've been made new in Christ. We don't follow the law in order to be saved anymore. That's not what the law does for us. The law could never do that anyway. See, Jesus saves you to restore you to God's good law, to restore you to God's design for his creatures. Jesus' cross means that the law is no longer your enemy because it no longer condemns you. You are in Christ. But we follow his law as Christians because his law gives us purpose and meaning. His law tells us what we should do to live as God's children. The law is freeing. It tells us what we were made for. See, it's no longer just about not committing adultery. It's not a good thing to do. You shouldn't do it, right? But it's no longer just about avoiding committing adultery. Now we get to embrace the roles that we've been given as men and women who have been made new in Christ. That's a liberating way of seeing the law. Because in Christ, the law invites you to live a sanctified life now, to begin to live in uh, in accordance with God's design now, to begin to live now how you will live for eternity. Your eternal life has already started, friends, and you get to start living it. Who are we called to be in light of who we are in Christ. You might remember back to your U.S. history, right? Where uh, England sent over a bunch of people and established the 13 colonies, right? And the whole idea of a colony is that you're starting to, to plant something somewhere so that the rest of the kingdom can come behind you, right? Does that make sense? Now, you know the rest of U.S. history. We kind of did the whole revolution thing and made our own thing, right? But you get the whole idea of a colony. Friends, the church is a colony of the new creation, What Jesus is doing by coming back again and establishing heaven on earth and making all things new, that is the kingdom of Jesus. 
we are a colony of that new creation. We have already been created new in Christ. We are the colony, and he is bringing the rest of the kingdom after us. We are a colony of the new creation still in the old creation. We get to live like that, friends. That's why the law is good. It shows us how we will live for eternity. Friends, when we let the Spirit guide us in God's good law, he reminds us of what we were made for. When we let the Spirit guide us in God's good law, it reminds us of how things should be. And when we let the Spirit guide us in God's good law, it reminds us of how things will be. Christians live according to God's law. One, because things just tend to work better when you live in God's law, right? But it also reminds us that we are his creatures and he is our creator. Living in God's law reminds us that his design for us ultimately points to Christ and his bride, the church. So who are you called to be in light of who you are in Christ? I don't deny it. We still wake up every every day in the middle of Armageddon, this spiritual war that we're caught in the middle of. We live in a messy world with that war raging all around us. But friends, the mess made by your sins no longer condemns you. That's the religion of Jesus. You are baptized. You are forgiven. Jesus is your head, and he is making all things new. You are made new in Christ, which means that you do not have to clean up the mess that you have made or remedy your own sins. Jesus does everything you do nothing. But by the Spirit's power, you can always take the next faithful step. Because Christ has already won the war, and the prize is the restoration of all of his creation. Who are you called to be? in light of who you are in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.